Welcome back to ASTR, the video magazine that brings together the best of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's past and present in order to inspire for the future. In this episode, Dr. Dragoslava Santrak, Managing Editor of the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, brings you another moving and inspiring story from the ESDA. Next, Dr. Galina Stelle, our Research and Evaluation Manager, shares recent research findings on Adventist Church members' attitudes towards healthy living. Then, ASTR's Research Center Manager, Ashley Chisholm, talks about a recent addition to our archival collections, a wonderful collection of historic photos from the China mission field. Finally, Meredith Carter, the editor of the annual statistical report, shares statistics relating to the denominations, Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department. But first, let's look at what happened this week in Adventist history. On August 8, 1932, William Mayhew Healy passed away in San Diego, California. Healy had been born on December 12, 1847, into a Baptist family in the U.S. state of New Hampshire. The family later moved west to California, where they became Seventh-day Adventists. In August 1874, aged 24, William became a licensed Adventist minister and began working as an evangelist in the California Conference. In January 1875, William married Clarissa Morrison, who was always called Clara. You see William and Clara here in this photograph, taken soon after their wedding. Later in 1875, William was ordained, and he and Clara had their first daughter, Burdina, known as Birdie. William was a successful evangelist and a popular preacher, which is evident from the fact that he was assigned the main platform at several California conference camp meetings. In 1880, he moved to the U.S. state of Nevada, pioneering Adventist work there. In 1885, the General Conference sent William and Clara as missionaries to Hawaii, then an independent island kingdom, not yet part of the United States. From December 1885 through April 1886, Healy conducted evangelistic meetings, supported by the work of pioneering literature evangelist Abram LaRue, who subsequently became the church's first missionary to China. In this photograph here, you see Birdie, William, and Clara Healy, with LaRue and another Adventist worker, all in front of the tent Healy used for his evangelistic meetings. Despite encountering strong opposition from representatives of other denominations, Healy's campaign was a success. He baptized nine people before he and Clara and Birdie returned to California. This laid the foundation for the creation of the Hawaii Mission. In 1887 and 1888, controversy was brewing around the teachings of Alonzo T. Jones and Ellett J. Wagoner, editors of the church's West Coast journal, The Signs of the Times. General Conference President George I. Butler and Secretary Uriah Smith feared that the young editor's views on the law and righteousness by faith were undermining what they called the old landmarks of Adventism. This controversy spilled over in the celebrated 1888 General Conference session at Minneapolis. In the run-up to that session, Healy wrote letters to President Butler warning that opposition was organizing against him in California. A few weeks after the session, Ellen White wrote to Healy, criticizing him for trying to prevent Jones and Wagoner from receiving a fair and open hearing. Nevertheless, William Healy continued to hold the confidence of church officials and the laity. John E. Fulton, later a prominent world church leader, said of William that he was one of the most able defenders of the Advent message and was used of God to earnestly contend for the faith. 
In 1891, William and Clara had a second daughter born to them, Emily, 16 years after the birth of Birdie. In 1894, William was elected president of the North Pacific Conference, serving in that office for three years. He returned to California in 1897 and for the next 27 years served in that state, chiefly as an evangelist, though also as a religious liberty advocate, a role in which he had great success. He partly retired in 1924, though only fully retiring in 1930 at the age of 82 and after 57 years of service to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. William Healy passed away at the age of 84, 91 years ago this week. You can read more about William and Clara Healy in the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at encyclopedia.adventist.org. That's encyclopedia.adventist.org. Today's story from the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, which can be freely accessed at encyclopedia.adventist.org, is about Brian Mansfield Dunn, the first Seventh-day Adventist in mission service in the South Pacific Islands to lose his life by violent means in the course of duty. Brian Dunn graduated in 1964 from the nursing program at Sydney Adventist Hospital in Australia and then married Valmer Ruth Benham, also a nursing graduate, on December 29, 1964. Nearly a year later, the young couple left Sydney for Atofi Adventist Hospital, then a 90-bed facility on the island of Malaita in the Solomon Islands to begin their term of mission service. On December 16, 1965, less than a month after their arrival to the mission field, Brian was returning from providing medicine for a patient when, standing at his own front door, he was speared out of darkness with a several feet long steel rod. The point of the spear protruded from his chest and the end of the spear protruded from his back. Valme immediately summoned help. The spear had to be cut with a hacksaw by one of the men who had come to help. The vibration from this lengthy process was excruciating and Valme firmly held the spear to reduce the movement as much as possible. With the point of the spear protruding both from his chest and his back, there was no way Brian could get comfortable or lay down. Aided down the long hill to the boat after midnight, Dan climbed aboard the 18-foot Catholic mission boat himself, that being less uncomfortable than being helped by others. The back was cut of a chair and all through the night, Brian sat on this chair during the long boat trip. He was supported by two young men who constantly sponged his brow. The group sailed through rough seas at times until they reached wallabies at the other side of the island. There, Brian was transferred aboard a larger and faster mission vessel, Danny, which sailed for the Eglinka Mission Hospital at Huambo on the northern point of the island. Contacted by radio, the Anglican mission boat Bradley set out to meet Danny and the crew supplied penicillin and morphine before arriving at Fuambo on Friday afternoon. Next, Brian was taken on board of a small plane that took him to Honiara and from there by ambulance on the rough potholed road to the hospital, where finally in the evening, five doctors began to do what they could to save the young missionary's life. On Sabbath morning, his prospect looked better, but by night he became delirious. Briefly regaining consciousness, 
Brian took the opportunity to tell those with him that he was ready to die. He died in his sleep on Sunday afternoon, December 19, 1965, at the age of 25. During the few days he lived after the attack, Brian prayed not for healing for himself, but for forgiveness for the unknown man who had speared him. Brian Dunn was buried at Honiara in the Solomon Islands the next day, with the leading dignitaries of the town among the 300 people in attendance. Although Brian Dunn served less than a month in a mission field, his sacrifice has inspired and opened the door for many Adventists to serve as missionaries in the Solomon Islands, and today, the Solomon Islands Mission has nearly 61,000 Adventist members and 210 churches. The witness of Valme's life after Brian's death is also worth noting. She returned to the mission field only a few months after Brian's death, serving as a missionary nurse at the leper colony in Papua New Guinea. I invite you to visit encyclopedia.adventist.org to read more inspiring stories about Adventist missionaries. That's encyclopedia.adventist.org. Welcome to Adventist Research. Today we will look at some data on Adventist beliefs about healthy living and avoidance of tobacco use. As part of the 2017-2018 Global Church Member Survey, participants shared their views on the statement, God wants us to take care of our bodies by avoiding alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. An overwhelming majority, 95%, agreed with this statement, of which 77% strongly agreed, while less than 3% disagreed. The respondents also answered where they had used tobacco in the last 12 months. The harm of smoking has been proven for decades, and many people have united their efforts to inform the public, especially the younger generation, of the dangers of using tobacco. The World Health Organization organized World No Tobacco Day, celebrated each year on May 31, to fight the tobacco epidemic and preserve the future generations. The research findings showed that globally, 97% of Adventist members reported abstinence from tobacco during the last 12 months. While it appears that most Adventists abstain from tobacco, a small portion choose to use it. About 3% admitted they had used tobacco products in the last year. Why is it so? Is it influence of the culture or the power of addiction? Interestingly, when we compare different age groups, tobacco use decreases with the age of participants. The highest percentage is from the group up to 20 years old, although it is still under 5%, and the lowest is the group who age 55 plus. The church members survey asked also about certain topics and how often members hear particular sermon preached. And so, what about sermons on holistic health? Overall, three out of five, 61% respondents, said they hear sermons on this topic frequently or very frequently. A quarter, 24% seldom hear such topics and 6% never do. And 9% honestly reported that they did not know the answer which means they did not hear them frequently as well. Thus, with 30% of those who do not hear this topic frequently in our churches, can we conclude that sermons on holistic health, including information about the harmful effects of tobacco, deserve more attention? Should we promote more widely stop smoking webinars with practical applications for church attendees and the local community? It is very hard to stop smoking when somebody has gotten into the habit of using tobacco. 
Let us be a support system for each other, and especially for the ones who are fighting this fight against this habit. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. As Adventists, we should all encourage each other to live healthful, abundant life. Visit our blog page at www.adventistresearch.info for more information on global research and data on this topic by division. In 2019, ASDR received a donation of 191 photographs, which once belonged to Samuel, Ella, and Gladys Frost, who served as Seventh-day Adventist missionaries in China in the early part of the 20th century. These photographs were all either taken by the Frost family or given to them. The photos capture scenes in the United States, China, Singapore, Malaysia, and the Philippines. They document the lives of the Frost family, as well as those they worked and served with in their field of mission. Samuel Frost was born in the U.S. state of New York in 1884, and Ella Noki was born in Alabama in 1887. They both became school teachers. Samuel taught science and mathematics, and Ella taught music. And they met while teaching at what is now Walla Walla University. The pair married in 1910, and the Frost spent the next few years at a succession of places, including Ames Academy in Idaho, Forest Home Academy in Washington State, and at South Lancaster Academy in Massachusetts. They sailed from San Francisco to China in August 1916 with a large group of Adventist missionaries. Except for furloughs and World War II, the Frost would serve in China until their permanent return to the States in 1949. Both worked as teachers, while Samuel was also an administrator. China was where they had their first child, Florence, in 1920. While on furlough in 1924, Florence sadly died just a few weeks before the Frost were to travel back to China. Samuel and Ella chose to adopt an infant, Gladys, that same year and returned to China. While living in China, the Frost also helped raise a young woman named Olin. After she married, she kept the Frost supplied with photographs of her daughters, Rena and Juanita Lu, even after the Lu's immigrated to the United States, where Rena and Juanita attended Walla Walla College. When the Frost received evacuation advice as the United States headed toward war, Ella and Gladys returned to the States in December 1940. Samuel was later evacuated to the Philippines, where he was eventually interned by the Japanese from 1941 to 1945. After Samuel was released, the Frost were reunited in the United States. Samuel was in such poor physical condition that the General Conference Secretariat ordered him to remain in the United States to recuperate. During this time, he taught at La Sierra College, now University, where Ella had been teaching piano since 1944. Samuel and Ella Frost were cleared to travel back to China in 1948 and did so. Samuel presumably took photographs of damage done to Adventist property in Shanghai during the war. The victory of the communists in the Chinese Civil War meant that the Frost return to China was cut short and they permanently returned to the States in October 1949. There, they again spent time teaching in California until they retired. Ella died in 1968, Samuel died in 1981, while Gladys died in 2012. The entire collection has been digitized. In collaboration with our partners at the Adventist Digital Library, we have made the entire collection available at bit.ly slash 3xcwewb. Just point your phone at the QR code and it will take you straight to the collection. To see an entire list of the photographs in the collection, peruse the Frost Collection Finding Aid under Manuscript Collections at AdventistArchives.org slash ASTR Finding Aids. Welcome to the latest statistical nugget from the ASTR Data Collection and Publication Team. For today's statistical nugget, let's dive into the Sabbath School and Personal Ministries World Statistics and its impact in the Seventh-day Adventist fulfillment of the Great Commission. In 1853, only a few years after the first group of Sabbath-keeping Adventists was formed in Washington, New Hampshire, James White organized the first regular Sabbath school in Rochester, New York. In 1852, estimating an informal membership of about 1,000 in the state of New York, White had written a series of 19 lessons appearing in the new Youth Instructor. 
From its inception, SABA School has focused on four emphases that are still prominent to this day, fellowship development, community outreach, Bible study, and foreign mission. A solid balance of these elements characterizes the most vital SABA schools around the world. In fact, the SABA School Alive is the current General Conference worldwide initiative that seeks to rediscover the power and purpose of SABA School through the divine model for true discipleship, Bible study and prayer, fellowship and mission. You can visit sabbathschoolpersonalministries.org for more information. To provide some context of the growth and decline in the area of Sabbath School, we will examine the statistics comparing 2011 to 2021. The three areas that have seen growth are Bible school enrollments with a 25% increase, Bible school graduates with an 81% increase, and community services units with a 3% increase. In all other categories, there has been a decline in the last 10 year span. Most notably, four areas that have exhibited a steep decline are lay crusades and seminars with a 79% decrease, lay Bible studies with a 71% decrease, pieces of literature distributed with a 43% decrease, and in gathering with a 34% decrease. In addition, baptisms declined slightly by 3%, as well as Sabbath school mission offerings by 10%. The sharp decreases may be due to the devastating effects of the COVID-19 global pandemic, or perhaps from insufficient reporting. Prayerfully, the Sabbath School Alive initiative will make a positive impact for many years to come. For more information on world statistics of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, go to AdventistStatistics.org. That's AdventistStatistics.org. Thank you very much for watching the latest episode of ASTR, which brings together the Adventist past and present in order to inspire for the future. We're so glad you were able to join us. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe on YouTube, and please let your friends know about ASTR. And if you've enjoyed this video, you might enjoy our social media. Just go to Facebook or Twitter and search for Adventist Archives. That's Adventist Archives. Join us again next time as we share more information and inspiration from Adventist history and today.